started. We'll start with a prayer. As the crowd continues to grow, it looks good. Nice crowd this morning. Um, let's join our hearts in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for bringing us together here this morning to, to read and learn your word. Another one of those commandments we're going to cover today. And Lord, we need your help with all these. They seem and are such heavy tasks for us, but with your help, we can all through all things glorify you. Help us in all the things we do and say to give honor to your name and praise to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Do we have an announcement? Uh, briefly. Yes. Yeah, so the pork sticks are available to pick up after Sunday school. They'll be in the fellowship hall. Uh, if you didn't pre-order one, we did cook about 30 extra or so. So if you'd like one, you can still get some. So that's my announcement. Very good. Do we have anything else? Anybody else? Uh, I don't think I see any new faces this morning. So I'm not too good at that. Um, don't forget, uh, we kind of switch things around. Thanks for life and uh, India Project or India Seminary is up here. We're moving things around on you a little bit. And with that, Pastor, please. Thank you, Don. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. Thanks for joining us online. Those of you that are meeting us there, uh, if uh, you have the ability at home uh, on the computer, double check on the website. There's a sheet for you to follow along and uh, an opportunity for us to, uh, to take something away from today. So we are starting our second half of the series uh, called Chiseled. And the hope is, is that as we've discussed, as we look into the Word of God and see what God says about these various commandments, uh, that we are learning a sense of God wants to continue daily changing us, transforming us as God's people. You have to understand, I hope, uh, after the amount of time that I've been here, uh, just uh, that, uh, however long that is, um, is that uh, you recognize that our job as church is to change this world. That's our job. We do not simply pray that God will miraculously do it. 
right? God has one plan and it's his church. There is no plan B. So when I talk about the fact that we are called to be chiseled and changed and transformed, that's so that our witness in this world is more godly, more God-focused, more God-directed. Um, it, it doesn't do your neighbor a great deal of good to just say, I pray that he comes to know Jesus or that she comes to know Jesus. If you and I aren't willing to say, use me when necessary, okay? Which means God ought to be directing when and how we describe uh, our relationship with God. So this morning, I want to focus on the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. I want to give a little word from uh, focus on the family here. Family is the fundamental building block of all human civilization. And marriage is the foundation of the family. The institution of marriage is unquestionably good for individuals and society. And the health of our culture is intimately linked to the health and well-being of the marriage. Right? I could not say that, support that any more, uh, any stronger in, in that. I, I've, I've shared this with um, a couple of different groups, and I'll share this with you. I believe that if we as people, not just as Christians, but as people, got marriage right, it would change everything. Right? That's, I can't say that about any other commandment, I don't believe, other than the first. Right. If you get this one right, and I don't mean that it's about getting it right so that somehow um, it, it is somehow God is, is um, you know, going to save us. But in the sense that if we understand how God has laid out marriage, in fact, he, here's the amazing thing is we and I'm going to touch on it a little bit today. Um, we think about gay marriage and we think about um, uh, uh, people living together out of wedlock and so forth, those kinds of things. Even though those things are, are widely much more accepted today than they were, say, 50 years ago. Right. Sociologists are afraid to say anything like this is bad for society. Living together is bad. Children out of wedlock is struggle is a struggle for us. Um, uh, 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 you know, people having babies out of wedlock and then leaving them and, and so forth. All of this, it is so abundantly obvious that within the bounds of marriage and family, that's the way you don't even have to be a believer to acknowledge that. To just be able to say this is good. So uh, I, I want to uh, kind of see this as the idea that when we, when we center ourselves on the word of God and recognize the power of marriage and we recognize that God is going to be the author and perfecter, I offer this guarantee uh, in all my premarital counseling uh, as I sit down with couples and sometimes in marriage counseling after the fact, uh, I tell them, if you keep God in the center of your marriage, your marriage cannot fail. Think about that, right? If you can keep God in the center of your mind, not just hang a cross in the living room, right? Not just, you know, say we get, did our vows in, in the name of God and, and so forth. If you can keep God, both of you, in the center of your marriage, your marriage cannot fail. Even if you sin, which you do as people, all of us do, even if we fall away, if you focus yourself on God and the goodness that he provides, the mercy and grace that he is, that marriage can survive and thrive, right? In fact, that's one of the reasons I sit down with couples on a regular basis, wanting their marriages to thrive by focusing on the word of God. I don't just focus on what you ought to do and do better and things like that. That's just, that's just kind of practicality. It has a, a relevance to it, but if we don't focus on the word of God, all we're doing is sticking Band-Aid on a cancer. We got to talk about the sin that is aware and around us. So the sixth commandment is this, you shall not commit adultery what does this mean? We should fear and love God that we lead a sexually pure and decent life that we see and do and husband and wife love and honor each other. Um, so I'll just say this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's all it is, right? That's, that's all it is. We don't have to make it more complicated than that. Love like God calls us to love. Live like God calls us to live. When I, when I get in arguments with people, and I do, I'm sorry about that. I wish I didn't, uh, but, I, but I feel very strongly about things, so I argue instead of discuss and think I want to lead somebody to the cross. Um, some of you guys know that we've studied uh, creation evolution in here. Um, I used to look for fights. Uh, when it came for somebody to say, oh, I believe that, you know, we all came out from apes. And I'd go, oh, yes. Oh, this is good. Right. And uh, you're like, uh, no, the goal is to get them into relationship with Jesus, not to beat them over the head with logic or knowledge or whatnot. But when it comes to the word of God, uh, I used to 
you know, spend a lot of times debating, discussing, and sometimes arguing about the things that have popped up into our world uh, in regards to marriage and family and all those kind of deviations from God's plan. Here's what it boils down to, guys, is that we simply fall back on the God says it, that that's it, right? If, if somebody says, well, why, why isn't gay marriage okay? Because God said no. You don't have to debate it and argue it any further than that. Do you know why they only have one husband and one wife? Because God said so. Now, Sociology would say you all couldn't handle more than one spouse. Okay, you know that. You struggle with the one you have sometimes, right? The point is, is that we understand that what God says, that's just simply a sense of obedience. Okay, that we just simply say, but God said so. You know why you honor our president? Not because he's honorable. Okay, now it's not a con condemnation against him, any president, right? You know why you do? Because God says so. You know why we pray for him every single Sunday? Because God says so, right? To do that. So, so to understand that, so we don't want to get to the point where, well, I want to follow this if and when, if I like, if I don't like, and so forth. This one, I believe, this commandment, the sixth commandment, I, I, I think is probably the most overlooked. I think it's the most overlooked out of, out of the important commandment that it is. And again, I'm not suggesting that one is more important. All of them chisel us. All of them move us and, and maintain us. But I think if we go back to this, that it is meant to be based on the word of God solidly, that this one is the one that we overlook. And, I, and I'll probably share that as we go along. So Exodus 20, 14 is it. You don't have to look it up. That's where all the commandments are listed. Uh, the sixth commandment is there. This commandment is directed toward the family. We often think that it's about sex. It's about intimacy, intercourse, things like that. No, couldn't be farther from the truth, uh, and I'll, I'll make that point in a second. But this is really about the family, right? Because you mentioned, or, or God mentions through this, that we recognize that it is a man and a woman, just like God set up in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, you have two jobs. Well, you guys probably know. What are the two jobs of Adam and Eve? I heard it. Be fruitful and multiply. Have kids. Okay, that was the plan in the beginning. Now, if there was no sin, no brokenness, that'll happen. With sin and things like that, there's, there's infertility, there's struggles, there's death. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, we lose children and so forth like that in delivery and whatnot. Uh, but that is one call. Uh, what's the other one? What did man and woman have to do? Take care of the garden. Take care of creation. So you're going to be stewards of what God has created and be fruitful and multiply. Okay, within the bounds of Adam and Eve. Okay, right. God did not bring two men together. Did not bring two women together. Um, he brought a man and a woman together. It, a very cursory uh, overview of the biology makes you understand it. Okay, it just does. Okay, and so as we see this, we recognize now. This is not a comment on your marriages, your family, and so forth. This is us more than anything else commenting on how do we impact this world to the glory of God. I hope that your relationship, whatever it is, gives glory to God. Okay, It doesn't have to be exactly in line with this. Maybe some of you have lost a spouse. Or maybe you've been divorced um, or, or whatever. Maybe not married yet. Whatever those cases are, that's not the issue of saying that here's the line and please walk it. Instead, to be able to say, how can we right now, wherever we are, still give glory to God? We don't stop, right? When there's a loss, when there's some change in, in, in structure and so forth, that we somehow eliminate that. There's a word in the, uh, in the commandment I just want to point out. It's the word of do not. It's the word not or the phrase for not in uh, Exodus. And it's lo na'af, lo na'af in Hebrew. And uh, it's not just do not commit adultery, that not commit is actually touching on the sense of idolatry. Do not idolize, right, the deviation of sex, right? Do not lift it up. Do not hold it up. Do not be preoccupied with it. Are we as a country preoccupied with sex? Yes. You bet we are. Unbelievably so, right? It, 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 we are bombarded by it. I'm going to touch on it today of some of the things that we've got to, we've got to be able to take some steps as God's people initially, and then hopefully influence the next generation and also the people around us uh, as we go through this. Would somebody please open up a Bible to Mark chapter 12? Mark chapter 12. We're going to look up a lot of scripture today. That's uh, a good thing. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Just that one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. 
Now, what I love about that, Jesus is being asked a question. What's the most important command? And he says, love God. But he kind of breaks it down into four areas. Now, what I want you to understand about that verse, if you're looking at it, uh, it really kind of is giving a, a, an overview of what you and I are, right? We are not simply mammals. Biology would say we are. I would tell you that it is pretty obvious, right? Even though um, we do this, I've, I've been over to some of your houses and uh, you have pets and you talk about your pets as if they are human, right? You kind of sit there and go, oh, she's happy or she's depressed because we just got home and, and so forth. And boy, she's really missing so-and-so. Nope. I'm sorry, right? They don't have the same ability to reason and think that you and I do. That's not being critical of you personifying your pets, okay? But you and I, we are created in the image of God. We are self-aware, okay? That's God created us. We understand, at least to some degree, eternity and life, okay? Pets don't. Animals in nature don't, right? When I woke up yesterday morning, the birds are singing. I didn't sit there and go, boy, they're really happy about something. No, that's what they do, right? They just have a switch, right? Sun starts coming up, you know, and out it comes, okay? Um, that was not a bird call. I'm really much better than that. Uh, the point is, is that we have to understand that when it comes to physical intimacy with someone else, prayerfully our spouse, but Paul does talk about if you have intimacy with a, uh, with a prostitute, everything is involved. Here's what I mean, right? Sex is not an animal function. It is for animals. Okay, I remember like, you know, my dog had take her out for a walk or something like that, and you'd kind of go, she's in heat, okay? That's a, that's a physical, instinctive behavior and so forth. My dog was not on the prowl, on the make, right? She's not, you know, looking around at suitable mates. It is just instinct that drives that. In fact, if a male dog smells, right, a female dog that's in heat, they just react a certain way. They don't sit there and kind of go, hey, how you doing? My name's Fido, and uh, I live on the next block. I don't know if you want to take a walk sometime. Maybe play with, the, play with the Frisbee or something, right? And then afterwards, they're kind of like, I wonder why you didn't call me afterwards, you know, and so forth. They are animals because they're animals. You and I are not. We are made up of mind, body, soul, and spirit, okay? And all of that is unique, and all of that is involved. I, I've shared this many, many times. When I was a teacher, I was one of those teachers that the students would hang out in my classroom after school and they'd often just talk to me about things and tell me what's going on. But often, sometimes it was my teenage girls, the students that, you know, were uh, dating and, and involved in relationships and so forth. So I kind of became the impromptu love doctor of Lutheran High School West, which I had no desire to become. Right? But they wanted to talk about their boyfriends or their breakups and how traumatic it was. If it was just animal right? Attraction that I'm with them and that I'm not with them. And some of these girls, I'm sorry to say, went farther than they wanted to, farther than they planned on and so forth. And because of that, they were wounded, right? Their spirit was wounded, their mind, their emotions, their self-esteem, all of those things, because we are not just simply mammals. So if we think that you can just casually walk into a relationship, be intimate and walk away, it's impossible, you cannot take those three other parts of our identity and put them in a box. That's why people that are hurt physically, there's more than just physical scars, right? There's emotional scars. There's, there's spiritual baggage to be able to carry through with that too. And, and it's also, guys, on the positive side, when we are intimate with ones that God has placed in our lives, like our spouses and so forth, that it's so much deeper than just a physical action. Right? It is spiritual. It is emotional. Right? It is intellectual. Okay? That's the reason that God created this. So it's one of the reasons that when we oversee this as just something that's casual, right? I, uh, there's, there's some terminology I'll throw out to you today, whether you're familiar with it or not. Um, we talk about some of the young adults, and I worry so much about them today uh, as, as our, our, our exposure to sexuality is, is so casual and so flippant and haphazard. Um, that this hookup culture, go to a party, you hook up with somebody, you sleep together and, and move on. And they think that that's okay. And they'll even tell you, this is just the way culture is and so forth. I work with those young people uh, at times and I find that every single one of them regret it. Everyone. I've never had anybody sit down with me and I'd say, I am so glad that I've been sexually active outside of marriage. It has just been an enriching, building up, you know, situation for me. Instead, they're kind of like, it hurts. 
And I, and I just keep looking for what fixes it and what makes it right and what makes me strong and solid again. And then I go back to something that animalistically I believe is just an action. And then I realize I said, and it hurts. And it hurts in much deeper and more difficult ways. Some of you could identify uh, with us that as you've been touched by it in your own family, maybe even you personally. Marital um, is a reflection of God and the church. The marital, uh, as I have here, the marital union is a reflection of God in the church. And I, I don't say that lightly. And, and here's what I'm after. I, not that this is on your outline, but I want you to just think for a second. What testifies to God's existence? Tell me. What testifies to God's existence? All of nature. All of nature does. The Bible tells us that. So when you see nature, and now's a great time in spring, things are coming alive, there's growth, it's an easy time. Uh, out of all the seasons, this is an easy time to believe in God, I believe, by looking at nature. Okay? How else do we prove God's existence or do we recognize it? That seems like the only one, right, that comes to mind? Marriage is one. It's always been one. Why, when God set it up, he says it over and over again, right? That the man is like Christ and the woman is like the church. The bride and the groom. Christ and the church. He says it over and over and over again. So if, if there is a marriage that seeks to honor God, you don't just honor God by going, I'm going to stay true to my spouse. That basically just demonstrates loyalty, which is good. I'll celebrate loyalty, but does it point to God? Not directly. What points to God is that we say, I'm going to recognize, I'll use my wife and I as an example. I have a responsibility as a married man, as a Christian married man, to demonstrate Christ to everyone who knows us through my role as husband. That's my responsibility. That is not something that we should take lightly. It is not something that should be easy. Right? It means that when people hear our conversations, that they ought to hear a sound of Christ in the church. Right? And, and before you start thinking about, you know, well, we're just elevating one gender over the other and the role and so forth. No. Right? Uh, because right away our, our world has um, kind of preempted that by going, well, the idea of feminism and, and equality and things like that, that Christianity is, is uh, um, uh, old fashioned. And, and domineering and gender uh, specific in that way and, and not at all. It, it says women submit to your husbands. Like what? Finish it. Like, like the church does to Christ. And, and so why do we worship Christ? Because he's scary? <clears throat> worship Christ because he did what? He died for us. Husbands, be willing to die for your wives. And she will partner with you, guaranteed. Doesn't mean you jump out in front of a bus. You might have to, I hope not. Right? But it means, are you willing to put yourself in that role to say, I would rather die than for my wife to suffer? And then wives, could you partner with a guy like that? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay? That's the relationship. It is not, do what I say because the Bible says so. I tried that once. Once. Right? <laughs> right? It was 1990, was it? No, I don't know. I don't know. Anyhow, Right? God's, God views marriage as a sacred vow. It's a promise. God actually cares about promises. Right? He cares about them. Ladies, would you look up 1 Corinthians 6 and gentlemen, 1 Thessalonians 4, please? Ladies, 1 Corinthians 6 and gentlemen, 1 Thessalonians 4. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Would you jump to 18, Joyce, too, as well? Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Isn't that interesting? There's this big list, laundry list of things that are going to keep a person from entering into glory. Every one of those is just simply a disobedience to God. If God is God to you, and I mean you revere him and worship him and, and seek him to follow him, that means grace is available to you. If you rebel against God and reject him, grace is not available. It's for you, but it's not available to you because you have not availed yourself to it. And then it goes through, it says, out of all these things, right, all these sins, all these deviations from God's, uh, from obedience to God, the one is sexual immorality and all other sins are done outside the body. 
you think about it, you just start listing them off. You're like, yeah, those are all outside the body. I steal, say things, do things, whatever. But sexual immorality is something that impacts the temple. Right? It's something that taints the temple. Now, it doesn't condemn the temple. Every sin is forgivable. Every sin, no matter how uh, grand we imagine it to be. But he says, here's the unique one. It starts then kind of in the temple, which means that everything that comes from that now has that to deal with if you continue in that. See, I, I, I was I preached a sermon once um, back in St. Louis. I went back for a wedding shortly after I, I took the call to Michigan. And it was one of my youth, uh, they were getting married and I went back and, and did the message. And so I preached on that Sunday and I, I quoted something on the fly. Sometimes the Holy Spirit does that. Um, I have a manuscript that I preach from most Sundays. And I, for those of you that work on the computer, if you're in here, most of the time I keep pretty close to that. Um, this one I just deviated and it just came to me. And I said, this was what it, what it came to was that um, temptation is not what destroys us. Staying under it does. Every one of you is going to face temptation. Right? It doesn't make you a broken, lost individual. It's whether or not you give up and into it. Okay? Um, it's, it's like falling into deep water. Falling into water doesn't kill you. Staying under it does. Right? And, and so that's, that's really the way that sin and temptation is. If we stay under it. So uh, my new members class just finished up. And uh, one of the things they were asking, uh, somebody mm -hmm. asked in the class was, um, you know, if, if we die, what about the sins that we haven't confessed up to that point? Are we doomed? Right? If you are a believer in Jesus, believing in his grace and, and practice that, um, you're living in a saved relationship. Okay, It's not like right before you have your heart attack, you're like, oh, just a second, forgive me for everything I did in the last three days. Ugh, woo, just made it. Okay, No, you're in a saved relationship okay, with God when you practice and live and, and so forth. So it's not that there's some kind of mechanical um, uh, confession that's needed. However, if you are living in a way that is clearly obedient to the calling that God has placed in our life, on purpose, day in, day out, and God says, you could be out of reach. Right? Even though you and I are sinful by our very core. Okay? If, I am, if I am living, for example, a homosexual lifestyle, and I just simply won't deviate from that. I won't take that away. I won't change it at all. If I leave this life, there's a real risk of my soul because I am choosing something that is contrary to what God calls me to be. Simple as that. Same thing if I were having an affair, if I were cheating people or things like that, if I was knowingly saying, I am rejecting God's call upon my life in this area, right? That's the consequence. It can be forever separated from God, okay? Um, uh, gentlemen, 1 Thessalonians 4 3. Somebody have it? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. All right. This is God's desire, right? Because He knows the weight of it. I often reflect on this. Um, do you guys know what the penalty for jaywalking is? It's, I think it's $12. Okay, $12 for jaywalking. Now, if Josh Hagemeyer was here, I could ask him. I don't know if he's ever written a ticket for jaywalking, right? But if you walk around downtown and so forth and jaywalk, do you know what the possible consequence for sexual immorality is? Death, disease, sexually transmitted diseases and things like that. It's not $12. Now, is all sin the same to God? The answer is yes. Are all the consequences the same? I just demonstrated it. Right? So do you think to God, our sexuality, the purity of marriage is more important than jaywalking to God? In a way. Right? Now both of them are rebellious, both of them are disobedient. But he put certain consequences in there. I can tell you growing up, right, my mom and dad had certain rules of the house. There were certain rules that had heavier consequences. We all knew that. Right? You just know if I let one of those words fly, it wasn't going to be, all right, no cookies for you. Now, it was more like duck and run. Okay, right? There was just, there was consequence. There's different ones. And so what I find is that the level of consequence often equates the level of importance, right? That God says, your sexuality, your family, your marriage is so important to me. I want to motivate you to hold it up there. And so the consequences from deviating from my plan are significant. It is not a $12 fine, right? I think of the things like HIV, right? HIV is a judgment. It's a judgment upon you know, uh, carelessness. Not all. I understand that sometimes blood transfusion, things like that. That's the world being broken. But do you realize that if you are chased as a couple, right, that you have about zero chance ever contracting an STD, a sexually transmitted disease? Zero chance. 
If you're in a part of a hookup culture where there's a lot of intercourse and hooking up and exchanging um, partners and things like that, extremely high cost, right? And are those consequential? Yeah, sometimes they change you for life, okay? And so those things that are in play, uh, I think, are relevant for us. All right, so there's four categories of sexual immorality. I know this is a little bit more of a, uh, of a teaching rather than a, a, a chiseling, but we'll get there. Um, the first one, the first category of sexual immorality we've listed and we've heard today is adultery. That's, that's one of the first categories that the Bible speaks of. Um, somebody give me, um, let's go to Deuteronomy 22, Old Testament. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. What do you think purge the evil means? Kill him. Yep, do away with it. Is it serious? I think so. Right? To say that if you're caught in that way. You remember when Jesus had the woman that was caught in the act of adultery, they brought her out, what did they all have with them? Stones. They were going to kill her. In fact, that's what they asked Jesus. Is it right? Did Jesus say no? He didn't. What he did is he put it in perspective for him. It was still right. In fact, you know who was the only one that should have thrown stones? Jesus. He that has no sin. I don't have any sin. I can judge her. Right? But this is also an opportunity to teach. Right? That sometimes we jump up on certain sins. You and I do that too. We have certain sins that we, you know, we rail against and we criticize people and so forth. And uh, like my mother used to say, you know, when you point at somebody, you got other fingers point back at you. It's kind of an old adage, but very true. We all have the same brokenness for us. Yeah, <laughs> so David's like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> now you're going to look at the next time I'm preaching. If I do this to one group, you're going to go, uh huh. <laughs> Pastor's getting carried away, right? Um, the idea of the, uh, the, uh, the sexual relations we have outside the bounds that God has created, right? Uh, in fact, I'll tell you that, that even homosexual uh, intercourse and things like that is adultery. It's sex outside of marriage, right? When you think about it, it is. And I'm not just trying to find a loophole. I mean, that's, that's another deviation of what God said. God speaks to it. And I, and I want you to know, as I speak to this, guys, I, I speak to it, I hope you hear with all love. And compassion for our fellow man that need Jesus, right? It's it's not a condemnation. I think the Christian church has has come out very very poorly in the way that they talk about sin because we don't talk about it in a way that we don't have any. We we have talked about we all need God's grace. We all need His salvation. But we're not helping anybody who's standing out in the road in front of a bus that's driving toward them and kind of going, "I'm sure they want to be there," right? I want to pull somebody out of the way of the bus. Right? If I believe that God has spoken to that specifically and it separates a person from availing themselves to grace, you bet I've got to do something. It's my responsibility, uh, lovingly. Um, the second one, a category of sexual immorality, lust. Lust. This isn't necessarily an outward, physical um, uh, uh, ex, uh, exposition, uh, demonstration. It is something internally. In fact, Jesus highlighted this one. When you talked about the sixth commandment, he says, you heard the commandment say, do not commit adultery. I tell you, don't even lustfully. Think about a member of the opposite sex, okay? And uh, now we're in really deep water, all of us. Because we might say, well, I have never had sex with anyone outside of marriage. So I only have nine commandments to worry about, okay? So limit one, you're already thinking that's good. I, I, I shared that story with you guys, I think, not too long ago. Um, in my confirmation class, pastor was asking everybody, does anybody keep any of the commandments? And I'm, I'm smart aleck, cut up in the back of class, and I'm like, yep. I've kept one. And Mr. Glendale, which one have you kept? Sixth commandment? Because I've not had sex. And so as an eighth grader, saying the word sex in confirmation class was really funny, right? And then he read this passage in Matthew, and, and he said, so how about now? And I was like, just move on. I don't, I don't want to be the center of attention anymore, right? Because obviously we all lust. There's a danger of lust because it's internal, right? It's hidden, and nobody else sees it. I got news for you. There's one that does see it, it does know about it, and it breaks his heart. Matthew 5, 28. Somebody have it? Just to be clear. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Yeah, looking at a woman. Uh, ladies, it's the same if you look at a man. I know we're not wired the same. That's a pretty big difference. Guys, we tend to be visually stimulated. Ladies, you're more emotive, emotionally stimulated. Um, and, and things like that. But it's still... In, in fact, I'm going to quote some statistics here in a, in a minute. But... Um, you know, it, it really does um, have a lot to do. And, and ladies, I'll speak to you and those that are tuning in as well. It's important the image that you put out in this world. It is important, 
right? Um, if, if you lead someone into temptation based on how you dress, that's, you have some responsibility in that. That's not me taking the farthest extent that all the terrible things that happen to women in this world is their fault. Please don't hear that. But we do have a responsibility to one another, right? For the same reason that, that how I speak and act to other people, I want to make sure that what I'm doing glorifies God. Um, if my daughter was here, I would ask her, uh, my, uh, the most popular series of what I would teach when I was working with teenagers and college students was love, sex, and dating. I, I would teach about seven, eight weeks on that, different things, and so you can understand why it was so popular, but it was so necessary. And I would tell her, I would, uh, and all the youth, I would say, here's how you look at a member of the opposite sex, right? Is you think to yourself, and maybe even say out loud, what a beautiful creation of God. I mean, I want you to think about what that would mean. Right? When I think of, of our teenagers walking down the hallways, um, you know, a girl seeing a guy, a guy seeing a girl, and, and looks at them and so forth. And now their mind can wander and lust right away. But what if their main you know, knee-jerk reaction was, what a beautiful creation of God. At least it tends to keep you in the guardrails, right, on the road. Okay? Because sin is always crouching, sin is always a challenge. But what if that was our knee-jerk reaction, just kind of, what a beautiful creation of God. Right? My wife will often drop that. We'll watch something on TV or see somebody. She goes, do you think she's pretty? Right? Now, I can tell you, early in our marriage, I made that mistake often. You know? <laughs> Who? I'm not looking anywhere. Right? No, I don't, I don't even notice her. But now, there's more confidence to be able to go, yeah, I think she's an attractive woman and so forth. But I don't want to go there in my mind to be able to go, boy, she's really pretty. Boy, she's attractive. Now I'm thinking about her. Okay? Uh, or ladies, vice versa, right? That we understand that um, we see this. Premarital sex. Maybe you're even intending to get married. Okay? And, uh, and, and so you believe that, well, since we've already become engaged or we're pre engaged or we're dating serious and so forth, so um, it's okay to do this because we intend to get married. Okay? And so we live together or whatever the case may be. Um, 1 Corinthians 7 2. Someone please. <coughs> First Corinthians seven two. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. So this is the idea of boundaries, right? Boundaries, premarital sex, living together. Um, I, 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 there's so much to talk about here. Um, probably half of the couples that I have counseled for premarital counseling before they get married, half of them, and I'll just go over the last. 15 years or so for me, uh, have lived together. And not necessarily with each other, sometimes with different people. And, uh, and I'm, I'm still called, right, to be able to, conf, you know, confront that and still speak the gospel. I can tell you, as your pastor, what I don't do. If they're currently living together at that moment, I don't necessarily slam the door and go, I will not counsel you, I will not marry you until that changes. And I'll tell you why. Right? Not because I don't believe in it, not because I don't think it's helpful, but what I found in my experience of doing that they go to another church down the way that won't talk to them about the gospel and they just get married anyhow. And so there's been no opportunity to share the gospel with them. Here's what I do. So I want to imagine that you are a young couple. You come down and sit down with me and Pastor Eric, we want to get married. And, and, uh, and so I start kind of poking around a little bit and said, hey, if I want to send you guys something, where should I send it? Oh, you can send it just to this address. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, you start to learn that they're living together. And, and so I confront it. I do. I talk about it. I don't just sit there and go, that's not really a good idea. I simply say, I say to the man, I say, hey, Liz, after you get married, do you think it's okay if you have a girlfriend? After you get married. Now, the, the soon-to-be bride wants to jump across the table, right, and choke the pastor at that point. Luckily, I'm a pastor, so I'm a little protected, okay? And, and she goes, how dare you suggest such a thing? I'm like, oh, so you think that's wrong? You see where I'm going with this. And they're like, absolutely, it's wrong. I'm like, Why? I said, I can tell you, I believe it's wrong, but you tell me why you think it's wrong. Well, because it's bad for us, okay? What if he agrees that it's good for him? Do you see how you disagree? I said, is this how you want to go through marriage? No. I said, do you think that there's an ultimate authority ought to speak into this that knows more than you? Yes. So here's my, my sense for people getting married. I want to get them into the living room, but if I can't get them in through the front door, I'll get them in through the side door, right? So if they believe that living together, I want them to make the decision then, that living together is not a good idea, right? Because otherwise you're going to continue on in your marriage making decisions based on what you think instead of what God says. That's what I want the conversion. So it takes me a few weeks to get through that, okay, and walk through it. 
Um, but I have had couples, uh, praise the Lord, that have just simply said, you know what, you're right. This is not a good way, and so we're going we're gonna to move out till after the marriage, okay? Not all of them, right? Because it is so simple, such a condition in our young people's worlds that they're living together that it's okay, okay? And again, God forgives everything when we come to him. That's what I want. I want them to come to him and say, I, I need something, you know, from, from God that I don't have. Um, this is uh, actually, if we take the word for sex uh, outside of marriage, it's porneia. And you can see where we get pornography from, right? Pornea, pornea uh, is sexual immorality and so forth. Um, the fourth category here is this, rape and incest. This is of a violent nature. Um, this is, uh, again, breaking boundaries that God has created. Incestual sex within the bounds of, uh, of a family. And uh, God speaks to this. I, I, when I read through those Old Testament laws, it just makes me sad. And, and not because you have to read it, but because God has had to take time to say it. Right? Do not have sex with your daughter. Do not have sex with your son. Do not have sex with your mother. Uh, do not have sex with your neighbor's wife and all those kind of things. And, and, and all of that, just this sense. And then the violence. Uh, of rape and, and those kind of things. It's just sickening that our sin has pervaded all the way into the very bounds of family. But I also want you to understand, Satan knows what he's doing. He says, if I want society to fall, I don't necessarily attack society as a whole. I attack marriage, which then affects family, which then affects society. He knows where to hit us, but he knows to hit us in the marriage. And if I can hit it there, the dominoes continue to fall, right? If I just make society as a whole kind of a questionable place and sin kind of pervades and so forth, but our marriages are still strong, our society will be strong. It all, it all hinges on marriage. It all hinges on it, all right? So how does America measure up to God's standard of sexual immorality, right? Adultery, it's very common in our culture. And now the Supreme Court's decision to legalize things like same-sex marriages, I just mentioned that one. There's many other things that common law marriage and things like that that were kind of like, well, if you're not going to be married, we're going to consider you married. Um, I, I can tell you that just about every couple that I've talked to that are living together, not married, if I get a chance to talk to the woman in this, in that situation where they're living together, almost every woman that I can go back to in dozens of, of circumstances, every one of those women were scared. <coughs> Everyone was scared that somehow the man was going to leave. And the only thing that was keeping the man there in their mind was physical intimacy. And what a scary way to go through a relationship. I'm going to keep doing something I don't necessarily feel comfortable with or get behind and, and agree with, but if it keeps him close. Now, what a, what a really debased way of seeing a relationship. That's because very animalistic. And, and yet to her, it's an emotional attachment. I, I used to teach it this way. Um, and, and please, this is blunt, so uh, forgive me in advance. Uh, a woman will often give the physical to receive the emotional, and the man will give the emotional to receive the physical. He'll say what she wants to hear in order to be physical, and she'll give the physical hoping that I'll also receive the emotional. And, and what a twisted cycle that that is. And they both think they're receiving what they're wanting, and in reality, they're missing the whole point. The whole point is God. Right? That God is, says the, the church and Christ, the bride and the groom and so forth, uh, to see that. Um, let me just keep cruising through this. You can look up some of these Bible verses as we go. Um, when it comes to lust, right? So how we're doing with adultery, not so good. How are we doing with lust? Well, pornography, internet, mobile devices, video, children. Uh, younger and younger children are exposed to pornography. Uh, every year. In fact, we've seen the trends in this in, in some law enforcement evaluations and things like that. The, the, the average age of a boy that's exposed to pornography is 12 years old. Average. Average. And, and one of the reasons is, is because of these things, because of phones, right? Because of access to the internet, because of very little supervision. Now, if I'm scaring some of you parents, good. Right? Because we can't just turn a blind eye and go, I'm, I'm sure it's not my kid. Um, I'll give you some data that will startle you today, I think. Um, but mobile devices, internet, and things like that. So here's some, here's some facts. These facts are five years old, so they've increased beyond this. 4.2 million porn sites. 12% of all uh, websites, 12% are pornography sites, 12%. 68 million Google requests daily for something pornog pornographic, 68 million. 
42% of internet users view porn. How many people in this room? I don't say that lightly, right? 100,000 sites are of illegal child porn, illegal things, things that break the law. 69% of men, 18 to 26, view monthly. 10% is uh, um, higher than that, uh, or an additional 10%. 24% of mobile devices contain safe pornographic material, a quarter of mobile devices. 90% of 8 to 16-year-olds have viewed porn sites. That's where I get the average of uh, 12 the other sites have been exposed to it. That's gone up. By the way, I read a report uh, last month that during the pandemic quarantine, some of those numbers tripled, tripled. Now, some of you can see that that's over 100%. Um, too much time on our hands, too much idle time, uh, too much availability, sitting in front of the TV, uh, sitting in front of the computer, and, uh, and no accountability, no supervision, right? And that's even for us as adults. Right, and uh, if you don't think you need accountability and and uh, and so forth, uh, we will get sucked into um, a sinful lifestyle, and it will cost us. And here's how, right? Um, linked to neurological damage in men is pornography, uh, brutalizing women, prostitution, child trafficking, organized crime. Right now, that, that's I'm, I'm just not blowing smoke and saying that there's a real risk of this. This is where this grows from. Right? This is a multi-billion dollar industry right now, pornography. Right? And, and so it is being affected. And so when we think about child trafficking, which is a sickness in this world, it is abysmal right, of what's happening. That is being driven by a sexual appetite that is perverted. Right? It is, it, they're not being sold into slavery to work. Very rarely is uh, child trafficking about that. Some foreign countries, sometimes it is. But most of the time, it's for sex. <laughs> Little girls, little boys. And, and that's, that appetite is not being fed only through the dark you know, corners of the criminal world. It's being fed on the Internet. It's right? being fed by the government with open borders and all the kids coming across. There's lots of things that feed it. And, and all of that is because we have, and this is where I'm, I'm at, is that this is why it's one of the most abused commandments out of the ten. Because we simply don't put our foot down and say, we are not going to allow this. We're not going to vote for those that do. Um, we're not going to speak to it. We're not going to stay watching a movie when those things pop up on the screen. I'm going to put things on my computer and my phone that keep those things from popping up in ads. I remember once I was doing a search. I was going to do a Bible lesson on uh, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And so I did a Google search, quotes, loaves and fishes, end quotes. And as you see all the pictures, I use a lot of imagery and pictures for things that I teach. A girl in a teddy showed up on one of the pictures, right? Um, and I looked at it, I'm like, how in the world did that search come up with that? I can tell you how. It had nothing to do with my search. It just simply says, if you Google something, right, we'll pop that up there because maybe you'll click on it. And then maybe you'll click on this and you'll click on this. It's a breadcrumb trail and eventually be up to your eyeballs in it, right? And that's the plan. That's the evilness of the abuse that is out there in this world. So we absolutely have to be changed, chiseled, and we have to be strong when it comes to this. All right? Um, premarital sex. Premarital sex. By age 20, more than 70% of men and women have been sexually active. 70%. That used to break my heart when I would see my students graduate. Right in high school, and just kind of see them, and just kind of say, you know, what path are you on, and 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 how can we help and protect and guide that, and so forth. Um, Fifty-eight percent of Americans accept premarital sex. More than half the people in our culture say, yeah, it happens. It's okay, whether you have an opinion of it or not. And uh, and and I know some of you have shared with me family members that are struggling uh, with it and things like that. I, I want you to know, um, stay strong. Take every opportunity to, to speak into their lives in a way that is encouraging because the, the ripple effect that you could avoid by not saying anything, it impacts the next generation and then the next generation. It only takes one generation to fall away from God. One generation. You don't share with your kids or share with your grandkids or the people in your culture around you. Um, it only takes one. And, and that's, the, that's the challenge for us. Um, virgins, when married... Have only a three percent chance of divorce after five years, and you're a virgin at marriage. That's that's incredible, right? For someone who has not been physically active when they get married, three percent divorced after five years, ninety-seven percent not. 
That's pretty, empow that's pretty empowering, I think. Those with uh, less than 10 partners, which you think is, is um, pretty incredible, but not today, um, is 33% likely to be divorced greater, after five years. Greater. greater than 10 partners. See, I said less than, greater than 10 partners. Um, I, I can give you all the data, but it's it's exhausting. You know, 5% and 10% and, and these things. Um, STDs, I mentioned this, would virtually not exist were it not for premarital sex. Right? No STDs. None of those things that are disfiguring, those things that you cannot be cured of, those things that, that change us, the things that cause birth defects and things like that, those things would be all but unheard of if we followed God's direction, right? That's how important this is. And, and for us to casually watch movies, read books, view things online that have very casual sexual connotations to it, it contributes, right? If we don't say no, and, and take a stand that God has given us. Um, it, it's just, we just continue down that road, but maybe we travel slower. I'd rather just not travel on it, right? Rape and incest, um, as those things occur, lead to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We see that a lot in people. It leads to suicide and, and massive amounts of drug abuse. Um, I met with somebody just the other day. I was visiting one of one of our members, and uh, she's, over, she's over 80, and she confessed to me the very first time. She said that her dad had abused her. She said, I've never shared that with anybody. And here she is in her 80s, and she says, I have wrestled with this for just so long. And, and it just it broke my heart that, uh, that you see the lives that are touched and impacted by that, and, and uh, brutally. And, and yet, folks, I want to tell you, there's hope. And the hope is, is the church. Right, it's it's sometimes sobering to realize that we live in this world, but we need to realize we live in this world. Otherwise, we just stick our head in the sand and go, oh, "Come, Lord Jesus, come! I'm with you, right? I bring it on, right? Take us to heaven." But if it isn't today, we have work to do, right? And we have lives to change and to improve and to bring hope. Um, Genesis says simply this: one man and one woman. Right? And that gives us our guidance and gives us our direction, and, and we don't deviate from that. Genesis uh, 2.23 also reminds us that in marriage, women are protected and cherished. Boy, do we need that these days. Right? There is, there is, a, there is a lot of brutality. There's a lot of impropriety. There's, there's just so much harm that is done to our women um, in our culture because of sex. Because we've decided that it is an okay exchange, right? It is okay to give this to receive this. And, and we've made it okay for us. Uh, Matthew 19, it talks about what God has joined together, let man not separate. I love saying that, right? In the, in the wedding, I love saying that at the end. We kind of said what man has put together. And, and basically I'm saying, don't mess with it. Nobody mess with it. Husbands, wives, don't mess with it. You people that are here viewing the wedding, don't you dare mess with it. And if anybody does, deal with it, right? Take care of it. I often tell my, uh, my men and women when I do premarital counseling, how are you going to protect your marriage once you're married? And that's one of the things we talk about. I'm going to make sure I don't let anything into this relationship that's going to harm it, anything at all, right? James 4, proximity. We talk about where we are with the things that are broken in this world. Will somebody read that? We'll finish with that one. James 4, 4 through 10. Good one to finish. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world must be. It might have to be Yep, yep, stop there though. Sophia, that's, that's enough. So the idea of you are a friend of this world, which means you are aligning yourself with this world. I'm going to movies, I'm reading books, I'm looking at things, we're talking about it, we're joking about it. As a Christian, we cannot do that. Because you're becoming a friend of this world and then your witness is tainted. You can't say, I love God and obedience to God and I want a God that glorifies him, but I don't mind watching rated R movies where there's sex going on, right? Where it's inappropriate. Now, am I drawing a line in the sand? Yes, right? God is drawing a line in the sand. We've got to be able to maintain this in a way because of what it leads to. I'm not just worried about your hearts. I'm worried about your families. I'm worried about your children. I'm worried about your neighbors. And I'm worried about this world because we are the ones who either shine a light or we hide the light. 
we got to decide what we're going to do. We either gather or scatter, light or dark, okay? Let's wrap it up. Aligning ourselves with this world will cost us heaven. If we align ourselves with this world, this world is doomed. God is going to destroy it and remake it. Don't be on that side of it. Instead, to be able to say, listen, it might be unpopular with my friends to hold the line. It might be unpopular to get up and leave the movie when I'm like, I didn't know this was in the movie. <coughs> it might be unpopular to, to put protection on your computer as a grown adult, but because the temptation is big enough, right? And yet God says, if you align yourself with this world, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, chisel us, shape us, transform us, Lord. We want to honor you with our bodies. I want to honor you with our marriages. I want to honor you with our families and our church. And so, Lord, it starts here with an understanding that your way is the way. Lord, uh, break us of that. Teach us that. Convict us of that. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.